going to be briefly covering some of these new technologies and how they can affect your users um, in a positive way, how they can reach your users in a positive way. Um, because the web is everywhere, um, in most places anyways, and it's very easy to reach your users. It's one of the reasons we like the web. And if you have a phone, if you have a computer, if you have a tablet, you're going to have access to the web in some form or another. And if you don't, there's probably someone tinkering right now to figure out a way to put a browser of some kind on that device. Um, but just by having the web doesn't necessarily mean that it is the best thing for our users. We've all got different ideas um, that can bring new features to our users that will greatly improve their lives. Um, VR, MR, um, lots of different options out there with machine learning. But if our users can't find it, if the performance is not where it needs to be, if it's not easily accessible, what we do, what we start to see is people just don't use the product. And so that's why today I'm going to be covering four areas where the web has seen some great improvement and how we can get our applications in front of the users, what technology that can provide, and how it can service our users. <clears throat> So to ground this conversation this afternoon, um, when I'm talking about web and web technologies, it's going to be kind of um, being shadowed against native. So web and web technologies are built on things like JavaScript, CSS, HTML. Um, there's others out there, but those are some of the big ones that we talk about. Um, Whereas data, you'll see things that are built in like C, C++, C Sharp, and it's compiled. Oftentimes with the web, it's something that is seen in the browser and is interpreted um, at runtime. This has some disadvantages, you know, one of them being speed. Data is oftentimes very, very fast um, in comparison because the OSs are built for that. So one of the libraries, the frameworks that they're meant to be run with. So the web also relies on a browser in many cases. And that's been a handicap. Um, because if you have a browser that doesn't support a certain feature of the web, you're starting to see people get behind or not have access to certain features. Whereas in most cases with um, the executables for uh, native applications, you're just sitting there at the edge of whatever they installed at that time. Um, the other part of it is traditionally the web has had very limited access to the hardware uh, of the device. Uh, that's improving. You can now use your camera, your microphone um, with web applications to do screen sharing or have a Hangouts call or Slack call, whatever you're using. Um, but there are still some limitations. Um, it's improving, but they still exist. Whereas with native, you get access to those features, your fingerprint readers, your touch IDs, your um, accelerometers. They're available to you and easily accessible. Um, best thing about the web, and one of the reasons we like it, is that it's available to everyone. It can hit them. I mean, we, we can't specifically know what device an individual is going to be running at all the time. So, could try to build an Android application and then miss out on all the iOS users that are out there. Or you could let, um, make an iOS application miss out, miss out on all the Android uh, users that are out there. Whereas the web, if you write a web application, the promise is that each of those would have a browser on those devices that would allow them to access it and make it safe. Which is one of the reasons so many people are forced to do that. Scales. So, um, web has evolved. It's gotten faster. People realize that uh, and, uh, companies like Google, uh, Microsoft have started realizing, like, man, this is where people are going. We want to make we're feeling pain points, especially on the performance side. They're moving um, everything they can to make this technology be available to everyone. And so we're seeing. Games. Now, native is also improving, but for today's talk, we're just going to be really focusing on that. Um, lots of new frameworks have made it very easy for developers to build up new applications extremely quickly. If you React, um, a 
ones that I've gotten used to work. Those type of applications make building out web applications very easy. The cloud has allowed us to have um, better performance where uh, applications aren't coming down or uh, as often. Um, you're starting to see more of that 99.9% of the time. <coughs> and then you're getting um, other services like Google Drive, Dropbox, which is now allowing you to put your files on the web, whereas traditionally if you had files which contained to your computer. These are just some of the areas where web is really trying to start to bridge that gap and that experience across Okay, so I first, uh, the first technology I wanted to talk about was the browser. I, I really uh, struggled whether or not I was going to display this uh, from an installable perspective because the browser is a browser. We've got the browser. Uh, but technically it is installed and it's pretty neat to see the features that people are trying to put into the browser to differentiate. Um, Google specifically is always releasing a new uh, version, it seems like, every week. And, um, they've really been pushing some of this new technology, some of the most. Um, with their Chromium uh, library, their Chromium uh, open source project, a lot of the web has started to be um, re Firefox, Edge, and Chrome are all using that same engine. And so you're starting to see support very uh, consistent across all those browsers. So that's starting to go away. Um, with that said, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Opera, Safari, they're all really kind of pushing for this evergreen, so you're always up to date. So you can't have those access to uh, the latest and greatest technology. But this is the main reason that I wanted to bring up the browser, is WebAssembly. Um, WebAssembly is one of the biggest pushes to try and get native performance for web. So the idea is that you can have languages such as like C, C++, and Rust compile down and be run and interpreted by the browsers. And you can get near native performance, again, bridging that gap. Um, this is uh, improving and you're starting to see really good adoption across all the browsers. It is definitely something that as we go forward, we want to start thinking about, especially if we're going to have more intensive uh, parts of our application um, doing more logic. So with that said, with each of these technologies, I want to be clear that there's going to be pros and cons. They're going to serve a purpose, but there's also been drawbacks. Some of these are becoming smaller and smaller and less uh, efficient, but they still exist. So some of the pros of your browser is when you install that, you have access to pretty much any web application that's out there. Assuming you're in a country that doesn't block certain, area, um, certain URLs. Um, it also has access to the current web technologies if you are part of that evergreen group that keep your browser updated. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's some people that don't, but uh, on a whole, you see that being made easier and easier. And again, as I said before, nearly every device has access in some level to a browser. Some of the cons for our users, if we come from a user perspective, which we should, um, you gotta remember the URL. And if you don't want to remember the URL, right now it's pretty much, I've got a bookmark. And if any of you all are like my dad, bookmarks have kind of lost their effectiveness because he has 3,000, and so you might as well be like, going through a dictionary trying to find it. So Google has now become his bookmark, if you will. Um, that leads to a lack of quick access. Obviously, Google's trying to improve this with their Omnibar and their address bar, where if you start to type, it tries to predict what you're going to go to, but it's still unworthy. Whereas if you have a desktop application, you just double click on the icon or whatever, bring it up through your finder, and there it is. It's available. Um, the other aspect is offline capabilities are very lacking. If you come to a browser with no internet, chances are you're going to see a dinosaur or something that says you've got no internet, which is frustrating for users. Especially when we start to consider those users that are in rural areas that might have internet. And if they do, they might be spotty or incredibly slow. So 
keeping those uh, users in mind, um, the browser can sometimes be a hindrance. It also utilizes imperfect local storage options. So unless you have an application that's interacting with other APIs or taking the brunt of that stored data on itself, um, you only really have access to like local and session storage objects, which is imperfect because if you have a clear cache, all that is gone. So again, these are some of the cons of a web application would run up against. Because it's imperfect, it would be a lot of other storage solutions, whether a database that you provide or using one of the APIs that Google Drive or Dropbox provides to users. So those are some of the pros and cons. So the next um, item that I want to talk about is hybrid applications. So this is where you start to really see people say, okay, I've got a user, he's got needs, I need to meet those needs in the best, most efficient way that I can. Um, and for time, this is what you'll see with a lot of mobile applications and a lot of companies or individuals that are small. So they have a, only a limited amount of time and resources to reach as many users as they can. So these web applications, hybrid applications essentially allow you to write web applications that are wrapped in native code to provide your users those native capabilities while still being able to get close to the right ones from anywhere um, mantra that, that some companies have been pushing. Some of the things that allow you to do this is, uh, and you might have heard some of the names thrown out there, but uh, Xamarin, Cordova, PhoneGap, React Native, um, or just using an application's web view and writing those bridging headers, which is the key part here. So you're now trying to marry web with native. And it does work to varying degrees of success. An example of this is we wrote an application, you really need to understand your users and use cases many times. So in our case, we had a need where we had some workers that needed to have access to their files on their phone. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was easy for us to be able to train. So we wanted a consistent interface, whether it was iOS or Android. We also needed to be able to push out pretty frequently, um, but we also needed access to some of the native aspects, on um, some of the native hardware that's on their devices, the fingerprint reader, their camera, their microphone, um, GPS. If we wanted to get into like accelerometer, we could do that, but we didn't find a need for that feature. And so, um, and the secured storage on the device, which was also very we were able to do that using Cordova, and it was very successful. These individuals before this really only had access to their files, which were easily accessible or readable on a phone through a computer. And that computer needed a VPN access, and it was very, very cumbersome. And in a lot of cases, you'd see those users um, not even bothering them, just trying to remember what they could and when they go back home write down that information. So it was imperfect, they, a solution that was very, very troubling for them. But by using this hybrid approach, we were able to quickly deliver them the functionality that they needed um, for this specific application. So some of the benefits and pros that we saw come out of this is that we were able to potentially reuse all of our views. So in this case, we wrote once and we were able to deploy our views to both Android and iOS. Um, we were, in our case, we didn't use the App Store, but um, we'll see a lot of people write these applications and then provide them on the native App Store, so the App Store for iOS or the Google Play Store for Android. Now, the benefit here is that discoverability. When I talked about the browser, unless you know the URL, you're just hoping the Google search will bring up that application to the top. And it's very hard to potentially filter the results that you're looking it's better, at least from a discoverability standpoint, on these app stores. Um, it was also able to be installed, so they had quick access. 
It wasn't something that they had to search around for a bookmark on their phone. They just brought up their, uh, their device, <coughs> hit the application, and then went right into it. And as I said earlier, you're able to access the new functions. However, um, what we did find is if we wanted to start taking this application and really say, okay, we want to tailor it towards Android users and we want to tailor it towards iOS users, the web portion of this started to break down. Because we would have then have to support the views that the native applications would have allowed us to be much easier. So we had essentially been trying to support two code bases in one. It also relied on some level to the support of the community. So if, for whatever reason, Cordova's community dried up, any new features for those bridging files to allow you access to those hardware components would be gone with it. And that was, uh, it's either do that or we have to maintain it ourselves. Um, it still had limitations on speed, even though it had access uh, to the native components. Um, and in the long run, especially when regarding the bridging libraries and if we wanted to support those new views, you could see issues in maintenance. But knowing those things, understanding what our users needed and what we could do with the resources that were provided to us, hybrid apps were able to be that measure to get us uh, the results for our users. The next one I'm going to uh, touch on is progressive web apps. You've probably heard of it in some form or fashion, PWAs, um, or progressive web apps. And really what it is, is it boils down to adding offline access for web applications. This is a really neat first step. Um, I, I don't personally see this as like the final step of what progressive web apps will be but it's a neat idea going forward and it does work. And I'll have a little demonstration of what this looks like. Um, major browsers support this on both desktop and mobile. So with progressive web apps, we're starting to see the ability for you to go to a website and you might have seen it on your phones more recently, especially for Android users, where it'll pop up like, you want to install this on your phone. And what that's really doing is it's registering that application, providing a quick shortcut to it, and then allowing offline access. So images, uh, some of the JavaScript will be cached so that you can start to be effective um, with your users regardless if they have internet or not. Um, most of the limitations from the web does still exist, but the offline capabilities uh, are where you see a lot of the improvement. So think of it from an individual's perspective perspective, they are in a rural area and they need access. They're about to go to their doctor and they might have good internet access at their home, but their doctor's office does not. So they are at their home, they load up on their device and they can have an application that provides them the ability to see their medications. Well, if you don't have a way to handle offline, when they go to this doctor's office and bring up that page. It tries to do a reload, all of their medications go blank and it says you don't have internet access. It's frustrating for the user. It's not doing what they need. So they have to resort to either writing things down, taking screenshots, and it can be frustrating. Well, if they're even inside of the, uh, the doctor's office and he says, okay, I'm gonna put you on this new medication and we can take you off in a couple others. Well, now they're going to have to remember to go back to that web application, remove those, uh, those new medications, add, uh, remove the old ones, add the new, as opposed to having an application that could simply be inputted and then when you regain access to the internet, it just sinks the information out. That's what progressive web apps can do. So, um, as a um, quick rundown of some of the pros and cons before I get into how easy it is to set up. Um, 
on some of the process, it still has access to the same web technologies. Um, it's probably at this point the closest to a write once run anywhere, especially as you can install it on your mobile devices and now desktop application, uh, your desktop OS. And it's very future focused, um, and as I plan to show you, it's becoming very easy to add to an application, at least the uh, setup. Some of the cons um, goes back to if an individual is not keeping their browser up to date, they might not have the same. Uh, feature set available to them. Um, right now, Google's doing a lot to improve this next time, but in a lot of cases, they can be clunky to install. Um, but Google's doing things like on their devices where it pops up and says, hey, you want to install it, alerting the user to, hey, these things exist. Um, and on the desktop, you can, act there, you can turn on a flag currently that will pop up in the address bar that says you can just install it directly from there on the Mac. Um, and unfortunately though, even though the offline improves, there are still some of the drawbacks that exist. So um, I'm going to show you a quick demo of what it looks like to add. So um, there's uh, for us developers, and this is mainly just to show developers how we can get started. Um, a lot of CLI tools are available that are sampling this for us. Um, in this case, I'm, for this example, I'm going to just use Teams uh, command line tools. So I'm the one, I'm in the terminal here, and I'm just simply hitting, uh, typing in view, create, my app, in this case, test app. I'll manually select, and then what we'll see here is I'm going to add progressive web app support for me. I'm going to just jump through the rest. It's going to build out with all the hooks that I need to get started with progressive web apps. So as this, once this finishes, you'll get an application uh, with a similar structure to what I have here. And the main thing, there's two aspects to it. There's a manifest, which essentially says, okay, this is how we're going to display uh, your application to a user while they're on a device. Mainly just know that these are icons. And then a shortening uh, the description of the application. And after that, what you'll see is hooks into whether or not there's internet that's determined, oh, you've gone offline. Or maybe, oh, okay, we've seen that there's an update to your application. You want to pull that update down. Um, here's some things that have been cached for offline use. So it gives you that flexibility as a developer to implement features that are going to be helpful for your device, that life cycle is set up. And what that PWA might look like is, as an example, um, short long ago, currently has a normal website that you would hit at one point or another. However, if I come over here, you'll see I can install Travago. Again, it kind of goes back to a little bit of the clunkiness that's currently getting worked out. If I install this, before I, um, before I install it, I want to show you that I have no access to Trivago on my device. can't find it. But after I install it, I can bring it up. And now what I have is the application running right there on my desktop. So when you think about this from a mobile perspective, it can be much easier for our users. It's much easier for them to just hit that app versus trying to find your website. Now, uh, I talked about the offline capabilities of this, so I'm just going to go ahead and turn off my Wi-Fi. And what Travago is going to notice is that I'm offline. So if I try It'll pop up and say, hey, you want to try and reconnect? And I can try and reconnect over time. But notice I'm not going to your an offline page. Um, Travago actually is kind of funny. Um, when you try and go there, uh, their solution for when you're offline is to give you a game, which it's fine. Um, it's probably a little bit better than just saying, hey, tough luck, no internet for you. Um, but you can see that you can make experiences that can allow users to recognize, oh, 
we know you're there, we know what's going on, you have your boss there. <coughs> You'll be there when you get back. Or in this case, just displaying the cache results. So the last uh, one I want to talk about today is Electron Apps. Um, you might have heard of them, you might not have, um, but if you've used some of these applications that I've talked about here, you probably didn't know it, but they're running on web technology. Slack, Visual Studio Code, Adam, just to name a few. There's a lot more out there. It's, you can view it as that hybrid experience that I talked about earlier as for the desktop. Again, this thing has a lot of benefits for users. Um, you can actually install it as if it was a regular desktop application. Um, it gives you access to things such as like threading, which can improve um, the OS threads, which can improve performance. Um, it obviously has the offline access. It's got quick access for users. Uh, you can write this type of application and deploy it to both Windows, uh, to both all of them, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, and it's very easy to add to web applications. And I'm going to show you how easy that is here. Um, so. With that said, all these things are nice, but we also have to understand that uh, the cons, one of the biggest cons that I've found is that it has a very large install. So something that you might consider might be only like a handful of megabytes, which aren't a big deal. This thing will be 100, 200 plus, which is definitely drawback. Files are not as obfuscated as you might want. Um, again, it's running on web technology. Um, and it can be a memory and battery haul um, in the wrong settings. The last one being that a lot of the functions can be duplicated to the web, so you need to think about, again, the use case for your users. Would a website, especially one with a PWA, uh, registered service workers, would it be just as good? But if we want to add one, it doesn't take much. Um, currently, <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, I built a small little web application that you could add a build to and a display on this, uh, this lovely calendar that here together. And it is responsive, so you can, uh, depending on the type of device that you're looking at, it'll give you different uh, views. And that's built the same way that I showed you earlier with that view scene alignment. Now, what happens at this point that I'm like, okay, my users really don't want to put their financial information on the web, which is something that they're really against, but they're okay with it being on their computers. Well, if um, after adding in the support for that local, I can jump over here to um, my application, and I'm using the CLI, I can essentially just add an electron builder so I'm going to quickly add that and show you what that looks like and what extra I would have to do as a developer. Again, this is not hard for us to add and it can be very powerful when we understand what's available for our users. So this is just going to allow you to see what it looks like, but the other option was there was npm run build, and it would actually build out the, uh, the executables that are necessary to uh, install on your device. So I'm going to close this up. I now have an application that can be installed on your users. Electron's neat because it gives you access to be able to uh, hit the file system the hardware. There's a lot of support around it. 
get Visual Studio Code, Slack, uh, um, Atom, they're all using these, this technology, so there's a lot of support. So, um, the moral of this story, um, or the moral of this presentation is uh, we need to think about our users, think about where they are and how to best meet their needs. Um, having, again, the best application doesn't do them any good if they can't use it or they can't find it. So, uh, using web, we can't get there, not relegated to just native at this point. Maybe a native application is the right thing. But maybe a web application can also serve the purpose. That said, I'm going to open the floor to any questions. Except for that last question, clarification, you mentioned Windows, Linux, Mac. Is that a small glass as well? Uh, no. So the question was uh, you can install on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Does that include small glass such as uh, iOS and Android? Uh, no, Electron is very focused on, at this point in time, I'm not saying that's not a common feature, but right now it's focused on those three. Um, if you were wanting to do a small class, I would recommend looking at these in my window phone. Um, you could run both of those uh, with relative, using the same code base, just different projects, one that runs with Electron as a build, and then another one that runs with WordPress as a build. Do we have any maturity in any of the space for the application? Uh, we do have some for the Cordova portion of it. Um, so the mobile application space, I've seen that used a number of times, uh, being on one of those products myself. Uh, as for Electron, I've not actually seen it yet. devices coming out, you've got Alexa View, you've got a, a TVs or you know like screens on refrigerators, um, smart TVs, I'm wondering from like a native web operating system, what what those those kinds of devices are using and where we see how we tap into those. Yeah. yeah. So uh, two questions there. The first was is there a device that's kind of rich in this? Uh, the one that's closest right now, uh, from my experience, has been Chrome Books, Chrome OS. Uh, they've been doing a lot to try and push that. With that said, they've also been kind of switching a little bit their perspective on that uh, because they just added the ability for you to install Android applications on Chrome OS. Um, they're looking at adding Linux to that Chrome OS. But when it first came out, it was definitely very focused on exactly like what you're saying, where they had a web store, progressive web apps were the way. Um, but they found that users still, there was a lot of it like, that wasn't getting any traction, probably because it was earlier than it needed to. Um, Firefox actually released a phone that was also like that, which <coughs> really failed. Uh, yeah, probably lacking the traction from too early on the doctor. Um, with that said, um, most, uh, you'll see Windows is now pushing out more uh, devices that are that have the smaller install clearly targeting users that are focused on the web. So um, I'm, I'm expecting that to increase. So not a direct user in this case, but it does bring us in. As for the Alexa and uh, Alexa show and those, it's really going to come down to the, what the SDKs are available. And then I believe we'll see very quickly the people that are adopting the web because it works so well. Um, that Apple's hybrid approach is probably first off, and then probably be adding, uh, it would be closer into just using these web technologies. Uh, I personally have not gotten to work with uh, the Alexa show for the Google Hub at this point, but I would assume that that's probably what's going on. So, do smart TVs like Samsung Smart TV or uh, Alexa, do they have their own proprietary native operating systems to support those devices, or are they leveraging? Some of the things you talked about. Um, a lot of them do use uh, web technologies. Um, I know that, uh, I don't know if it's one of them actually.
actually uses the LG, um, but uses WebOS, I think, a fork of that in yeah. their operating system. Okay. Uh, so adding uh, adding applications to that um, probably are going to fall in some of that line. Of Again, I unfortunately. Thank you very much for your all's time. Uh,